Sonoma is a city, Infineon is a company. If you're talking about the racetrack, it goes by just one name, Sears Point. Watkins Glen may be fast, the Roval may be trendy, but Sears Point is the closest NASCAR comes to a no-holds-barred off-road rally. An oasis of motorsport insanity flanked by farms to the west, wineries to the north, wetlands to the east, and San Francisco Bay to the south. I can't be impartial here. I've grown up counting the days until NASCAR returned to my backyard. I first attended a race there on June 7th, 1992, when I was nine years old. My brother and I were in hog heaven. It was truly Christmas in June. I got Derek Cope's autograph. He got Terry Labonte. It also proved historic. This is the same day we lost Big Bill France and gained a worst to first rally by our local boy, Ernie Irvin. And it was the only California stop for Richard Petty's fan appreciation tour. His STP Pontiac was parked right in front of us on Pitt Road. The track also gave me a foothold in my media career. I first covered the event for another website in 2010, then for the first time under the last car banner in 2014. I've also worked as an intern for the track, promoting their FIA World Touring Car Series event in 2013. One of my videos was used as part of the track's 25th NASCAR event that same year. I'm forever thankful for the opportunity. Had it not been for those experiences, I doubt I'd have the privilege to cover the other events I have in years since. In the face of the worldwide crisis, it seems trivial to bring focus to the cancellation of this year's running of the Toyota Save Mart 350. But I think it's important to remember why we should all be excited for next year's race. Because in just over three decades, so much has happened on this 2.52 mile road course spread across the side of a hill in Northern California. Now, for purposes of this video, I'll only be focusing on stock car racing's history at the track, as it's the series with which I'm most familiar. But in this small fraction of the track's 51-year history, there is more than enough to talk about. By the time it joined the NASCAR Winston Cup Series schedule in the late 1980s, Sears Point had been running stock car races for two decades. In 1969, one year after the track opened, Ray Elder won a race in the Pacific Coast Late Model Division, the series that would become today's Arca Menard Series West. West Coast regulars like Herschel McGriff, Roy Smith, and Chuck Bown were among the names made on these hills. These same drivers also competed at Riverside International Raceway, a similar road course built in the desert east of Los Angeles. There, the West Series competitors would get to run alongside the stars of the Winston Cup Series up to three times a year. The last of these races was held on June 12, 1988. Rusty Wallace took the checkered flag, while 13th place Bill Schmidt led the West competitors. Both would face each other again one year later. On June 11, 1989, as Riverside was plowed under what is today a mall in Moreno Valley, Sears Point would hold the inaugural Banquet Frozen Foods 300. It was only when the Cup Series arrived at Sears Point that they realized just how difficult the track really was. Gone were Riverside's long back straightaway and wide open runoff areas where drivers could harmlessly cut corners through the desert sand. Instead, drivers were constantly surrounded by guardrails, tire stacks, and steep green hills. Putting just one wheel off the track meant disaster. And yesterday, Alan found out to drive off the track. Like Darlington, it shouldn't have been possible for stock car drivers to fight their way around the track. By the time they hit the start-finish line, they are already full throttle into turn one, then heading up the hill into turn two at the peak of a 104-foot rise. A hard right-hander and a little bit of a dip again, and then they would head over into the third corner, which would then be reached by 3 and 3A. Three Going up to the top of the hill at 3A had a blind spot where you'd only see sky, then curbs, then the sensation of your right sides bouncing off the ground. Heading down into turn 4, it was downhill once again, where turn 5 awaited with a slight runoff and a large embankment staring you in the face. You would then go back uphill again and enter the carousel, one of the most treacherous left-handers on the course. Down, downhill once again, the corner seeming to go on forever, underneath the crossover bridge and back onto the drag strip. The drag strip would lead you under another crossover bridge, which signaled the entrance to turn number seven, the first of two hard hairpin corners. Drivers would try to find their way underneath you as you would make the hard right-hand corner and set your yourself up for the entrance of the S's. A brief straightaway would lead you into corners 8 and 8A, which were a tight left and right hand switchover, and underneath the bridge you would enter 
corner 9 and 9A, a much longer, more rolling sequence of corners. Between 9 and 9A was another drop that sent you hurtling even faster than you wanted to go for the approach to turn 10. An even smaller runoff and a concrete barrier was all that kept you from crashing onto Highway 121. It was here the fans became a part of the action. The exit of turn 10 ran just behind the main grandstands, which faced the opposite direction from where they do today. Cars could be heard speeding down the hill and past, where another hump signaled the entrance to the track's most iconic corner, turn 11. There, they jam on the brakes, then speed back towards the stands at turn 12, where the starting line stretched across the drag strip. And so, for 74 laps, a portion of the crowd was surrounded by the roar of engines. The inaugural running featured a thrilling battle between two of the best road course drivers of the day, Ricky Rudd and Rusty Wallace. In the final race at Riverside, Rudd had won the final pole, and Wallace the final race. The two banged doors again at Watkins Glen, with Rudd edging Wallace for the victory, and they would come to blows once more in the Napa Valley. And now, Rusty Wallace dogging Ricky Rudd, as I mentioned last year at Watkins Glen, these two slugged it out for the lead with Ricky Rudd taking the victory and Rusty Wallace finishing in second position. Rusty has $76,000 on the line in addition to the prize money here. If he can pull off the victory, they head for turn number seven. Here is one of the racetrack's biggest passing areas. He moves to the outside of Rudd. They're side by side through the corner. And now Rudd and Wallace bump and Rudd runs him off the racetrack, but it really doesn't slow Rusty very much. He only drops back a couple of cars. We've got one more left to go at Sears Point. Ricky Rudd is the winner. Rusty Wallace is running in second spot. The final time they go through corner number one. Rusty Wallace trying to take over the lead and win $10,000, whether $76,000 in addition to the first prize money. Now closing in very tightly on Rudd into turn number three, turn number four. Rudd holds off the challenge of Rusty Wallace. They come down and enter the carousel for the final time. And Rudd still has command of this race. I think he's withstanding that pressure very, very well. He's still driving his own race out there. I can't hardly believe as, as the highest emotions is right now. Ricky Rudd doesn't appear to have slipped one time. Now here's the, the corner that Rusty Wallace has been able to gain. Can he this time? Well, he did going in, but he slid. He went in there so hard, he slid a little bit, but I believe he did pick up maybe a little bit, but Rudd has been doing pretty well through the S's from here on back to turn 11, but Rusty has really been going into turn 11. Let's see how things shake out here as they're nearing the checkered flag. They move through the S's. Turn number nine now. Continuing uphill through corner number 10. They'll enter a short straightaway here and then heartbreaking for corner 11. If Rusty's going to do it, he's going to have to do it here. I don't think he's even going to make a challenge. Well, oh, he smokes the tires, gets sideways in corner number 11, and it appears as if Ricky Rudd is going to win the Banquet Frozen Boots 300. He waves the hand, he crosses the line, and Rudd wins! Rudd and Wallace would each win two races at the track, and both would remain yearly contenders until the very end of their careers. Before those pesky stage cautions came around, it wasn't uncommon for the top two drivers to shadow each other in the final laps, each trying to force the other into a mistake. This has resulted in some absolute heroics by the race leader. In 1993, Jeff Bodine had to contend with Ricky Rudd and Ernie Irvin, winners of two of the previous four runnings. Boy, we have seen some unbelievable finishes here at Sears Point in the years past, and I have a feeling we're going to see it. Oh, it's Jeff Bodun! Oh, he saved it, but I think he's going to lose the lead. Here comes Urban alongside him. They bump, and Urban has the lead. Maybe he had some debris or a little dirt that was kicked out on the racetrack there. And Rudd is, going to, Rudd is going to try to outbreak Jeff Bodine. Bodine trying to outbreak Ernie Irvin. <laughs> so now what's going to happen? Bodine is going to get the lead back. That's what's going to happen. And here comes Rudd going to try to take the lead back from Bodine. Bob now knowing Jeff Bodine is sideways and saves it. Now here comes Rudd on the... Well, he blocks that move. Cannot make the pass. Jeff Bodine was totally sideways and saved it. 
In 2012, the race went green for the first 85 laps, during which Kurt Busch's unsponsored Phoenix Racing Chevrolet never lost sight of Clint Boyer. Of course, for the first time here at Sonoma, the guy that did it last year, Kurt Busch, trying to deny him. He's right in his hip pocket. And, and what I see, when, you know, Kurt last pit on, back on 72 or something like that, but Kurt's car stays even the whole run. I mean, you'll see some of these guys start coming back to him, but Kurt's car is very consistent. Boy, he's looking, he's, oh, he's good there. luck right here. Yeah, he's at the bottom here. He, he, rolled, one. he rolled in there pretty hard and lost it, lost it on the exit to that corner a little bit, Kurt did, but he is all over this 15 car. And I think it's like you said, Wally, there his car is... Too. He's just breaking a little bit later. He's using his stuff up earlier as you are. Jeff Gordon perfected this as the track's all-time champion. Not only had he won five races and poles, but he gave other drivers all they could stand. Mark Martin in 1997. Gordon tried to go to the inside, couldn't make it happen. His last shot to pass will be down into turn 11. Mark Martin trying to break a 42-race winless streak. His last victory was at Charlotte in October of 1995. He didn't win a race all during 96. Here they come up through the S's now. Turn 10, and they're headed for that final opportunity. The best passing place is coming up. Jeff Gordon closes right in. He looks like he may try to go to the outside and pass Mark Martin. He's not going to do it, though, and he gets sideways coming off the corner, and that allows Mark Martin to take the checkered flag and win the Save Mart Supermarkets 300. And Carl Edwards in 2014. Through the high-speed portion of the track for the final time. Gordon closing in as they head toward turn 11. Gordon driving it in hard. Edwards locks it down, maintains the top spot, and drives off a turn 11 clean. He's won 22 times in his career, but never on a road course. That's going to change today. Carl Edwards, a winner at Sonoma. Underdog drivers and teams have also seen to find their way up front here. Wally Dolenbach Jr. enjoyed two of his best Cup Series performances in 1994 and 1996, nearly ending long losing streaks for both Petty Enterprises and Bud Moore Engineering. In 2008, when Yates Racing was on the decline, David Gilliland returned to the site of his Cup debut two years earlier and finished second to Kyle Busch. And just last year, Matt Benedetto crossed the line in fifth, saluting Daryl Waltrip the whole way. The race has also seen some of the most colorful entry lists of the season. In 2004, Austin Cameron qualified a car fielded by Bill McAnally. Brandon Ash qualified for three races in 2004, 2006, and 2009, all in his family's number 02 sponsored by Sprinter Trucking. Jim Englebright was always a standout in the Southwest Tour and Winston West races at Sears Point. He qualified a Jelly Belly car in 2002, nearly did the same in 2003, and then earned a ride with Richard Childress in 2004. The following year, Brian Simo drove a Childress car to a 10th place finish despite heavy front end damage. Three years later, Simo would qualify a year-old car of tomorrow, sending three fully funded cars home. And two years after that, Simo attempted to qualify Tommy Baldwin's Chevrolet, which was powered by a Toyota engine. Each of these drivers making the show were just some of the wild moments in qualifying, which has also seen its share of incidents. Swings are out wide, coming over. Whoa, too wide. Uh oh. He spins. Whoa, tire hit barrier. Tires. Oh, my goodness. Heavy impact for Bobby Labonte. A whole drive down. Ricky, uh, Ricky Craven's in trouble. Entered that corner way too hard. Hold on. You know what? I don't know. Just right there, you can see the back end start to come around with it. It's on FX. Whoa. Lock that right Whoa. front up right there, and he's in trouble. Whoa. Around he goes. Well, we're seeing so many cars get in trouble over there. Man. Hang on. Back in just came around, coming into the S's there, and once again, very lucky he could even keep it straight and keep going. Whoa, baby. Whoa, whoa. Oh, boy. Oh, he's got trouble there. Something. Something came way apart. Yeah, you can hear it. 
Some drivers like Sterling Marlin, Dale Jarrett, and Matt Kenseth always seem to struggle at Sears Point. Marlin finished last at the track in 2002 and 2007, but enjoyed one of the best runs of his career in the 2000 race. He beat Jeff Gordon's Rainbow Warriors off pit road and led 25 laps before Gordon got back around him, leaving him second. Dale Jarrett finished 41st or worse three times, including a last place finish in the 1989 inaugural, but he still earned a pair of top fives in 1997 and 2005. Matt Kenseth, however, may have been the only one happy to see this year's race cancelled. In 18 starts, he still has an average finish of just 21.8, with a single top 10 finish, an 8th in 2008. Whether in early May or in late June, Sears Point's role as the first road course of the season has sometimes proven a stumbling block to a driver's championship. In 1992, Davey Allison crashed in the S's and finished 28th, a crash overshadowed by Allison's more serious wrecks in the Winston and at Pocono. In 1998, Jeremy Mayfield came into Sears Point as the point leader after winning his first career race at Pocono. But Jeff Gordon won the race, took the point lead, and never looked back in a historic season. In 1990, point leader Morgan Shepard's record-setting streak of 11 straight top 10 finishes to start the season came to an end at Sears Point. Shepard was still running inside the top 10 with four laps to go when the engine blew, leaving him 28th. The track has also seen more than its share of drivers who've attempted to compete despite injuries suffered earlier in the season. Jeff Bodine making it back for the first time in four weeks. Remember early in May in Charlotte, he had that practice wreck and he broke three ribs in his right side, punctured a lung, was in the hospital, had to have surgery, had to actually have a tube inserted to decompress the pressure in his lung and let the lung reinflate. He is back in a race car for the first time and he has a rib protector. Now he was dressing earlier today and putting this bright yellow protector on made by Power Athletic Equipment out of Texas. It's an air impact system. It has a, a foam vest surrounded by a piece of carbon fiber as he buckles his rib protector on and he can, you can hit him and pound him with whatever. He can run back and forth in the seat and it doesn't create a problem. It makes him sort of a Superman as Jeff Bodine uh, will show the crowd. He's still buckling uh, and he has this big Hulk Hogan shirt, by the way, which he was sent when he was, uh, and, and which makes him a very muscular guy. He was catapulting, somersaulting, tumbling across the start finish line at Talladega Motor Speedway. Now, he underwent surgery on his left wrist just 12 days ago at Indianapolis by Dr. Terry Trammell. He has a pin in the wrist, and he's wearing a carbon fiber Kevlar cast, which is hinged at the wrist so he can handle the steering wheel. That shouldn't be a problem. His ribs, still sore, may be some concern. Now, if he does have a problem, he needs to get out of the car. They've got 1991 Trans Am champion Scott Sharp standing by to relief drive. Now, we might mention that Terry Labonte, also injured at Talladega, has real problems. He has a 1992 Trans Am champion. Jack Ball is standing by to relief for him. Craven's car overturned twice, flew into the catch fence, then overturned again, clearing five cars on the way down the banking. A bruised lung, other bruises, and a compression fracture of the T3 vertebrae will not stop Craven from starting today's event. Here's Dr. Jerry Punch. Unbelievably, Ricky Craven jumps in the race car. We didn't jump in the car. He climbs in the car very gingerly here at Sears Point Raceway. He will drive a single lap in the car number 41. Now, yesterday, Ricky Craven was not driving the car, and the guy who qualified the car, Ron Hornley, who we'll talk to in a moment, was up playing with his buddies in the truck race at Portland. Who got in the race car to, to test this car with the race engine? How about the seven-time Winston Cup champion, Dale Earnhardt? That's Earnhardt driving the Kodiak Chevy in the final practice session yesterday. Don't say these guys don't care about each other and really want to be a part of Winston Cup racing. And now we're with Ron Hornaday. There's the Earnhardt car back there. Is Earnhardt getting ready to start. And Ron Hornaday, uh, you really were called and asked to be a part of this show, and you agreed to come out here and help. But how about the qualifying effort? Great run for you. Thank you. It takes a, two good teams, my truck team, to have the run we had yesterday at Portland, and Ricky Craven's team to do it. And, uh, you know, NASCAR, everybody's been a great help flying me back and forth to both these races. Good opportunity for me here. We're just going to go out there and run it and try to get Ricky Craven some points. By the mid-1990s, the Winston West competitors gave way to so-called road course ringers, who would take over the challenge of battling the top drivers in Winston Cup. 
Two of the first at Sears Point were Irv Hare and Tommy Kendall, both with experience racing closed fendered cars on road courses. Hare was a factory driver for Oldsmobile, and Kendall was a four-time champion in Trans Am. Hare picked up three rides at Sears Point from 1990 through 1992. His best run came in his first time out when he ran eighth in a second car fielded by Richard Jackson. Terry Labonte, Jackson's primary driver, finished just 35th with a burned clutch. In 1991, Kendall drove in relief of an injured Kyle Petty and was still leading with three laps to go. Now, in the past we've seen several times they touch a little bit coming into the turn. Martin drives her in deep and locks the brakes. That won't get it. Well, here he comes. Back him on the outside. He might be able to do it. Oh! Again. Martin spins around and slams into the guardrail on the inside. Wow. Mark Martin has spun, is going to be able to pull away, however. He's going to put one of those tires in the middle of the racetrack, and Bobby Hillen hit it. A lot of action has been seen in turn number seven, Ned, where you are over the years, and we saw it again today. There's Tommy Kendall with all the cars going by him. I know Felix Sabatis must be, Gary Nelson, the crew, must be so yeah. sad. And Kendall can't get the car to turn, almost ran in the bank. Yeah, he's struggling with that car, and it's a really tough break for Tom Kendall, but he has definitely proven himself as a great race driver for the future in Winston Cup racing. Hard work for the type of finish you had today, but you're still able to smile. Uh, you and Mark are parked next to each other here in the garage. Have you had words yet? Well, Steve Meal came over right afterwards and said, hey, you know, that's race and don't feel bad about it. But, uh, you know, we got together going into the corner. Mark got into me a little bit. I got a little loose. Then coming off, I was just picking up the throttle and got loose, tagged his uh, left rear, and he got around, and that's what uh, bent my fender in on the tire. So uh, I don't think the finish was real indicative of how we were running. I think Ricky and I probably ended up 18th and 19th, but uh, that's what they call it racing. Well, you also had a really great run here. I know you're looking forward to going out to New York and uh, driving Kyle's car there. Yeah, you know, we were taking one race at a time. You know, I'm really thankful to Felix Sabatis and the whole Sabco team for putting me in the mellow yellow car. And, uh, you know, we wanted to get a win or a top five finish here. Didn't happen. We've at least got another one to look forward to. It's not next week like all the rest of these guys, but we've got one in August. Right after Tommy climbed out of the car, Gary said, what are we going to do at Watkins Glen? Tommy said, hey, we're going to lap the field. Back to you, Bob. The next year, following a serious injury at Watkins Glen, Kendall drove a car prepared by Felix Sabatas and owned by Jimmy Means. He passed the eventual series champion in the final corner to take 13th. Kyle Petty and Alan Kowicki are going at it, and also Tom Kendall is right there for position. All three of these guys going for the 12th spot. Let's see how they come out. Kendall looks like he's going to pass Alan Kowicki, and here comes Kyle Petty. He takes 12th spot. 13th goes to Kendall and 14th to Kowicki, unofficially. Kendall made six cup starts at Sears Point, each for a different team owner, but the 1992 finish proved to be his best at the track. Kendall's misfortune was matched by other road course specialists. While he would go on to finish third in 2004, Scott Pruitt started out as a struggling rookie in the year 2000. At Sears Point, he found himself in the lead, only to have the most disastrous lap possible. And Stewart now sets his sights on the leader of the race, Scott Pruitt, as they head for the hill once again. And Stewart is right alongside him, and Pruitt has to hit the brakes. And Tony goes around. And it's a hill here. And Burton gets back in front. Here goes Gordon trying to take the lead. And I doubt there's going to be a caution as Stewart is able to maybe get back on course. Yes. to get the lead results in several positions lost for Tony Stewart. And Scott Pruitt is also off. Well, let's see, is he going to be able, it looks like he's rolling, just waiting for traffic to get by. He might be able to go again if he can get an opening in the traffic. Yeah, he's gets traction, so he'll be able to go, so no caution for him. But, and Scott has oh, driven man. into another tire barrier, this time deeper than before, and so the fourth caution of the afternoon will come out. 
In 2002, Jerry Nadeau was running away with the win for Petty Enterprises until, well, you know the rest of the story. And it's over. It's over. What happened? It blew up. From 2004 through 2006, Tom Hubert got Kirk Shelverdine's car into the race for three consecutive years. And he put that car in the show. But he finished last each time. In 2010, Marcus Ambrose seemed destined to break through, but he decided to save fuel at the worst possible moment. Uh-oh. Ambrose just stopped on the track. Yeah. Unless um, he's lost, lost a gear. This is going to be interesting. In his last five starts there for JTG Darty Racing, AJ Allmendinger qualified no worse than fifth, including a pole in 2015. But in his last start there, he took the checkers in stage one, only to make a costly mistake. Well, we call that the money shift. You're trying to go from second to third, and you get first and set. Jamie McMurray also limping around course. We're under caution in Sonoma. It seemed all but certain that Robbie Gordon would join them. After finishes of 41st and 37th in his first two starts, he returned to run a strong ninth in the year 2000, driving an electric orange paint scheme on his own number 13. He carried this momentum into 2001, when he was a road course ringer hired by Jim Smith to take over for Mike Wallace. Gordon started seventh and twice found a way around Jeff Gordon, but when a lapped Kevin Harvick elected to take on fresh tires, the result was heartbreak with just 11 laps to go. A caution would not be. Caution's out. Stewart, get past Gordon. Here they come. They're running to the caution. They're racing back to the caution flag. Just two years later, Robbie again took the lead, and this time had to hold off Jeff Gordon for the final 31 laps. Jeff's run in there pretty hard, but the problem Jeff's got is when he tries to get back on the gas, I think the car just, the front end takes off with him. Well, it's pushing, pushing, pushing. Finally, the front wheels bite, and the rear wants to come around and gets loose. The singular Chevy, the DuPont Chevy, and then the Goodwrench Chevy. Kevin Harvick, the front three. Bill Elliott's he comes. Gordon's going to try all he can right down here going into turn 11 to give him a look just to let him know, hey, buddy, still here. This might be his last best chance, Darrell, right here with one to go. He got out wide here last time, trying to make it like a crossover move. He's trying to he's trying to work with that push he has. He's trying to take the car out wide and cut it down. White flag for Robbie Gordon one trying one for his go. second Winston Cup win. Hit him this lap, buddy. Uh, I think Robbie Gordon showing a lot of he's showing a lot, a lot of style right now, buddy. Johnny Benson may be out of gas. For the first time in six years, Jeff Gordon has not led the most laps in this race. Robbie Gordon has. A couple of critical areas here. This is one of them. This is the next one right here. Don't mess up right here. Get in here smooth. Kevin Hamlin not gonna get, protect the inside. Not going to get past down through here now. Only thing you can do down through here is let Gordon close up so he can make a run at you. Here he comes. He's not going to be able to pass him here, but he's going to be able to set him up and turn 10 is what he's trying to do. Four turn 11. Four turn 11. Here he's going to make a run at him right here now. Here he's going to come hard. Robbie's in there. He's going to block him. Can't make it. Nice try, can't wait. Robbie gets off the corner. He'll have his second Winston Cup win. One turn to go, turn 12. Robbie Gordon, California kid, is going to win the Dodge St. Mark 350. While the two Gordons settled the finish in 2003, both first had to contest with the drivers who started first and third, the new dynamic duo of road course ringers, Boris Said and Ron Fellows. Said made 17 starts at Sears Point for 11 different team owners. After his sixth place run in 2003, he finished there again in 2004, this time for MB2 Motorsports. He then reunited with his truck series team owner, Mark Simo, who along with crew chief Frank Stoddard formed No Fear Racing. The number 60 finished ninth in back-to-back -back Sears Point races and even nearly took the checkers at Daytona. 
More known for his success of Watkins Glen, Ron Fellows made nine starts at Sears Point for six different owners. The first came driving for Joe Nimichek in 2001, when he led 20 laps before he was eliminated in a late race crash. He drove for DEI in 2003, leading 21 laps and finished seventh in a car formerly driven by Steve Park. He returned to the team in 2008 and was running among the leaders when he got caught up in someone else's mess. Oh, oh, Harvick goes oh, in! just took out three guys, four guys. That was incredible. Oh, one just barely got by that. And Harvick just got in there way too deep, got on the brakes, got it loose. That's an incredible dominoes effect. That's an incredible, I don't, I don't think I've seen three cars spin well, like that either. Synchronized spinning, and there's Ron no, Fellows, no, after, Fellows was the other car. after a great run that he had today. Fellows was just one of several drivers who gave the race an international flavor, joined by fellow Canadians Patrick Carpentier, Jacques Villeneuve, and Roy Smith. In addition to full-timers like Juan Pablo Montoya, Marcus Ambrose, and Daniel Suarez, there were also part-timers and one-offs. Christian Fittipaldi of Brazil, Hideo Fukuyama of Japan, Klaus Groff of Germany, Belgium's Mark Gussens, Max Pappas of Italy, Jan Magnussen of Denmark, Matthias Ekstrom of Sweden, England's Andy Pilgrim, Puerto Rico's Victor Gonzalez Jr., Alon Day of Israel, and of course, Australia's Dick Johnson. Oh, well, he was a little upset with himself or the car or the track or something. In any case, Johnson slides off into the tires. Climbing the tire barrier in turn two became a staple of Sears Point for many years. Joe Nimichek did it in 1995. Derek Cope did it in 1999. The same corner has proved vexing since the very first race in 1989, especially on the first lap. When the green flag dropped in 89, several drivers in the back of the field piled into each other. In 1998, Jerry Nadeau ran off course from the outside pole. Jamie McMurray did the same in 2006, this time lost control of his car. Oh man, McMurray's in trouble! Seen that happen so many times! Turn one was no picnic either. Prior to 2002, the entrance to the corner was much faster as drivers could use the two-lane drag strip on the front stretch. Richard Petty had already suffered a serious accident there in 1991 when he struck a protective road barrier, but in 1999, Steve Park and Ken Schrader both backed into the barriers at high speed, sending their cars into spectacular flips. First of all, Kenny, are you okay? Yeah, we're up. I was starting to get a little tighter in a couple of fast turns. I was down in the right rear here, hung the right rear in the slick stuff. She started coming around, just held on, I knew it wasn't going to get pretty. Even with today's barriers, the corner has remained treacherous. On the final lap in 2017, Casey Kane tangled with Kevin O'Connell, causing serious damage to Kane's Chevrolet. The carousel turn, which made its return to the circuit just last year, has also trapped several cars. Butch Miller in 1990, Lake Speed in 94, and Kenny Wallace in 97. The famous tangle between Derek Cope and John Krebs occurred before the two ever got to the corner, locking fenders on the approach to turn five. Nine is able to get alongside Krebs. This is going down towards turn four. Now, he, uh, Cope is going to try to make the pass as well, but I think Krebs doesn't realize he's there. They make contact, and which turns both cars straight. Man, oh man, what's that car flipping? Yeah, it flipped high into the air, rolled over in the air, and then when it landed, it was on its wheels. This same corner also proved hazardous for R.K. Smith, who hit the embankment in 1991. A lot of dirt and a lot of grass. Fortunately, it didn't flip over for him, Bob. It, even though it's uh, sitting on the side of that bank, but it did remain on wheels. The road course equivalent of the big one has most often occurred in the S's, where drivers often try to run side by side where they could barely run single file. In 1999, Rusty Wallace forced Ricky Rudd off course, causing him to swerve into oncoming traffic. Oh, and there's Ricky Rudd! Track, Rudd, oh, racetrack! Oh my goodness, Ward. hard contact! Ward Burton hard into the tires, as is Rudd. Man, that was quite a crash, and it occurred right in front of our broadcast position here, near turn number 10. In 2006, the very same thing happened to Ken Schrader. Uh oh got another car around over here coming through turn 8. Oh, no! Schrader, oh, no! Hard no. Lick. Kenny Man, Schrader got Sterling Marlin in the 14 car, and they're still stacking up. Casey Mears, 
one car T-bone Schrader extremely hard. Oh, it was an incredible lick. And twice in 2015, David Reagan found himself in trouble. It, Larry nailed it. These drivers, a lot of them lose their mind at the end of the Whoa, year. Whoa, like right Reagan there. and Edwards, there they go, into the wall, hard. Then there was Pauly Haraka, who in 2013 crashed before the race even started. Got into Alex Kennedy, both set to make their Sprint Cup debut today, and here's a replay of what happened. That's just guys oh. not paying attention. That's, That's all right. that is. But Sears Point's true calamity corner is turn 11. The four of P.J. Jones atop the 99 of Carl Edwards. That's ugly right there. Oh, yeah. Four cars are out. There he goes. Kind of, what the heck? I'll let him go and then pay it off. And, and I can guarantee you that... All clear. Oh. All Vickers has been thinking about since he got turned by Stewart was getting in a position Looking to for do it. this. Look. However, since aerodynamics have historically been less important at Sears Point than Watkins Glen, it's not been uncommon for damaged cars to exceed expectations. In 1993, Dale Earnhardt finished sixth after rear-ending Tommy Kendall at the entrance to turn two. In 2006, rookie Denny Hamlin started 40th, stoved in the nose, and still recovered to finish 12th. And in 2017, Clint Boyer's battered Lightning McQueen car slid off track, then fought his way to a runner-up finish to teammate Kevin Harvick. Virtually all the winners at Sears Point have been historic in their own right. The black flag played a role in two consecutive years. First in 1991, when it was weighed for race winner Ricky Rudd, giving the checkered flag to the driver he spun out, Davey Allison. Here he comes, waving to the pit crew as he passes by. The black flag is shown to Ricky Rudd. Rudd is shown the black flag. Davey Allison is shown the checkered flag. They did not give the win to Ricky Rudd. By no, they gave the black flag to Ricky Rudd as he came down and passed under the start-finish line. They waved the checkered flag to Davey Allison, and he apparently is going to win this race. You know, I don't understand this. You know, I've been racing since 63, and this is about one of the darndest calls I've seen made in a long time. You know, they've told us in driver's meeting, the last lap, you're on your own. But Ricky was not driving dirty. He touched him, sure, but they're in a hairpin turn, and I could have pushed the 28 car around with my hand. But, I mean, it would have been reversed. It wouldn't have made no difference. And, you know, these guys are out here trying to win the race, and it come down to the last lap, and, it, and you know, you got to be able to race. And if they're going to take this away from us, this is totally wrong. I've seen it happen time and time again through the years, and they've never taken a race from no one yet doing this. If they do this, this is rotten. Obviously, Waddell Wilson very upset. Let's check in with John Kernan. I'm standing by with Davies crew chief Larry McReynolds and still a bit of confusion. They gave the black flag to Ricky, gave the checkered flag to you guys, but you haven't gotten any official word yet. I, I don't see how it could be no confusion. You know, I, I worked with Ricky Rudd for two years, and that ain't Ricky Rudd style. If they let him get by with that, you know, then I ain't got a whole lot to say about NASCAR's procedures. A 28 car, Texaco, Havlin Ford won the race, and that's the way it is. In 1992, Ernie Irvin was black flagged for jumping the start. Irvin served the penalty and came from the last spot to win, tearing around the road course at a track record pace. Here he is, Ernie Irvin, off of corner number 11. He sees the checkered flag from starter Doyle Ford. And here it is, the checkered waves, and Ernie Irvin has won the St. Mark Supermarkets 300 from Sears Point International Raceway. Yes. Modesto, California native Ernie Irvin gets out. Ernie, congratulations on an outstanding effort. I tell you, you know, uh, we, we had that bad start there. The start, I went with the green flag dropped, and uh, no, that's not when you go. But, you know, Tony just kept me calm all day, and we had a good race car. I don't know how we did it, but we did. Jeffrey Bodine was emotional when he won in 1993, as he just purchased the assets of the late Alan Kowicki to start his own owner-driver operation. Likewise, Carl Edwards' win in 2014 came on a weekend when he was hounded by rumors of his impending departure from Roush Fenway Racing. Rusty Wallace's win in 1990 was the last for Raymond Beadle's team Blue Max Racing. Clint Boyer's narrow victory in 2012 was his first for Michael Waltrip Racing. Martin Truex Jr. would make it back-to-back -back for MWR the following year, scoring his first cup win in more than six years. He did so after a bizarre incident in practice where his air conditioner caught fire. 
In 2006, when Jeff Gordon won his fifth and final cup race at Sears Point, he just announced his engagement to Ingrid Vandebosch. Dale Earnhardt's win in 1995 was his only checkered flag on a road course. Richard Childress wasn't at the track that weekend, as he was on safari in Africa. Because when you get in victory, oh! lane, it means so much more. Earnhardt gets a little loose coming through there. He sure did. The rear end got around on him that time, but he didn't lose. <laughs> Man, Mark's trying to turn that six-car over, isn't he? <laughs> oh, oh, right on. Shot on the back bumper. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know if you're getting excited, but I am. Uh, I wouldn't want a steady diet of this, but I really look forward to it. Oh, here we go. Here we go. He's got him on the inside of turn six. Never could have thought he'd make the pass there, but he did it. Now let's see if Mark do anything with him here coming into seven. Earnhardt's got a bigger lead. Yeah. Got a good lead coming in here. And he's been getting through this corner good. Both of them have Mark's car slides coming Whoa. in there. there pretty hard. He kept under control of that. Jeff Gordon moves up on Mark and Earnhardt pulls away. They come through the corner. And for the first time in his NASCAR Winston Cup career, Dale Earnhardt wins on a road course. There's a checkered flag. He beats Mark by about three car lengths. Jeff Gordon, Ricky Rudd, Kerry Labonte, and Ted Musgrave are following. Well, I've won a road course. Maybe, maybe I break the ice and win Daytona next year. <laughs> In 2007, Juan Pablo Montoya became the first foreign-born driver to win a Cup Series race since Earl Ross in 1974. He was the event's first first-time winner, and also the first to take the checkered flag from a starting spot outside the top 13. Montoya started 32nd when he won. The track also saw the final Cup victories of both Ricky Rudd in 2002 and Tony Stewart in 2016. Stewart's win ended a three-year winless streak and came in his final season in competition. He also successfully retaliated the first last lap pass in the race's history by repassing Denny Hamlin in the final corner. I mean, we knew he was having, you know, issues Here we go. the car. Uh, uh, uh. Stewart inside. Oh, he Hamlin is there. Water. He Wait, gets whoa. Hamlin. They whoa. hit. And Stewart comes off turn 11. Oh, Look at that. Oh, He's oh, coming oh, to the flag. Oh, How did that Tony happen? Stewart How did that happen? Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Whoa. All right, man. How does that feel, buddy? Still a champion, buddy. In 2015, Kyle Busch held off his brother to take the checkered flag. In so doing, Kyle won his first race since returning from serious injuries suffered at Daytona in February. Along with Stewart in 2005, Busch would win his first race of the season at Sears Point and carry that momentum all the way to the championship. This is awesome, uh, just unbelievable. I can't say enough about my team. Everyone at Joe Gibbs Racing, I can't say enough about my, my medical team, everyone that got me back in shape and got me back ready to go and get behind the wheel. Sears Point remains one of the most unique events on the NASCAR calendar. It has been one of the largest sporting events in Northern California. So much motorsports history has been made here, and when this storm passes, there will certainly be more to come. So what was your favorite moment in NASCAR's history at Sears Point? And who do you think's going to win when the series returns? Make sure you tell me in the comments below. As always, thank you guys for your support. Thank you especially to the support of those in the last Rion, and look forward to more content here on YouTube.